Thank you for coming to our session on the role of big data and machine learning in the new financial landscape. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Julapa Dixiani. Julapa is a Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia economist and has served as a special advisor in the supervision, regulation, and credit department since 2008. Prior to that, she was an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Julapa is a frequent speaker and an expert in the area of financial markets and banking supervision and regulation. We are lucky to have her here today to discuss her most recent research in the role of big data in the new financial landscape. Welcome to us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity to share my work here. Uh, so my, I know a lot of, I was sitting in the, this room earlier uh, for machine learning uh, session and it was very interesting and I realized that many of you are in comp sci uh, area and I'm not so I'm just trying to learn machine learning and uh, telling you about how it has been applied in the financial uh, world and how it impacts consumers and how we uh, regulate banking returns, banking firms. Uh, so, so just a just a background. So we are, what we are, I'm going to start by look, uh, telling you about fintech platforms. Have you have you heard of lending stuff or you know lending platforms like Prosper, Cabbage, Square? Okay. So so I probably would would have added some more slides to give you some more information about that. But let me introduce to you. Um, so there are a lot of um, lenders now in the shadow banking sector that make loans to small consumers and small businesses and they compete with banks but they are not subject because they don't take the profit right it's called peer-to-peer -peer lending or marketplace lending they match initially the idea is to match borrowers uh, borrowers and lenders directly through this small platform uh, so they're not subject to banking regulations the way uh, large banks like City or Bank of America or even small banks, community banks are subject to. So, uh, so they use this technology, advanced technology and big data and machine learning and AI to learn about our identity, our, uh, how we behave, our financial situation and they are able to make quick credit decisions much faster than what banking institutions would usually do. Uh, so you could get a lot of approval in minutes as opposed to days or weeks. And so they claim that these platforms are now uh, claim that they actually make pro introducing better products at a lower price. So it's cheaper, better and faster products and services to consumers, right? So they are the disruptor and banking, traditional banks are uh, incumbent trying to figure out what to do, how to adopt this similar technology in making loans in uh, you know, competing with these platforms. So banks actually started doing that. It's harder for banks to move fast because of their legacy system. So their partner, there are some, a lot of partnerships that like Lending Club would partner with uh, consortiums of say 200 community banks with pipeline that would take loans from Lending Club, but Lending Club originate uh, basically make credit decisions for them. So this is what we are going to talk about today. So we have these fintech lenders that challenge in incumbent banks. They are not subject to regulations, and they are growing very fast. So uh, Lending Club started in 2006. And uh, it slowed down, that growth slow a little bit, slowed down a little bit after the financial crisis. But uh, as of 2016, they have made $28 billion of uh, consumer un um, unsecured installment loans. So it is actually the largest lender for that type of loan in the U.S., even including uh, loans from banks, commercial banks. And so they use this 
big data, non-traditional data, and what we also call alternative data, which could be, uh, which we will talk about in the next uh, slide, what are the alternative data that they use. Uh, is it fair for them to use that information? Actually, uh, banks may not be allowed to use those information because it may not be uh, comply with fair lending. Uh, it may have rest variables in there, it may have education or medical payment. Uh, so, you know, it's controversial whether it should be used or not. Now, uh, so this next slide is basically how, this I stole this from PayPal presentation, uh, that how FinTech impacts, you know, all the financial world in many different ways. So, uh, so what I'm going to do today will uh, talk about the different alternative data that these platforms use and um, the benefits and the costs and what we are worried about, what should be the concerns and how are, what are the impacts on consumers and financial stability overall. Um, so as I said, you heard about machine learning, big, big data. At the Federal Reserve, we use big data for, uh, and it depends on how you define machine learning. Logistic regression we use all the time. We have been using for 50 years, right? <laughs> but the data that we use for uh, stress testing, for CCAR, loss projection, for example, we, get, we use now big data, low level data, account level data. So we have, we look at 30, 40 million uh, transaction data, account data just to predict, project the CCAR losses, right? But um, the industry has gone beyond that. Beyond big data, they use this AI and ML and combine it with many sources of data. This, uh, have you heard of data aggregator? There are a lot of data aggregators that now access data from bank account, from credit card account, from uh, your cell phone, which you know, from what earlier session I talked about, what kind of apps, what your shopping uh, habit, your social network, your rent payment, a lot of information is there. And if they have all this information, of course, this information is was collected from many different sources, and so they, uh, it was not easy to merge them all together. It's a big job. But once they have access to all this data, who owns the data and how they use it, that has not been... It's not clear yet at this, at this point who, how it is regulated. But uh, a lot of our data is there, out there. And so um, I, have a, I have a start, two, two papers that look at the role of this information, but it's more interesting to actually uh, go into this fintech world, right? This is what it looks like. There's a blockchain, which was in the other session, machine learning, AL, cryptocurrency. We are looking at fintech lending <coughs> in this, in this uh, session today. Uh, many different terms related to fintech uh, that you could uh, you know, just Google. There are many, many fintech conferences, I would say, almost every week, somewhere in the US. Right? And I'm um, going to go back there a little bit about um, the concerns related to using this uh, big data and alternative information. Because uh, this process, the process that uh, when they process the data, it's not clear how the credit decision is made. Because uh, there are supervised and unsupervised machine learning that uh, the previous session talked about, and also deep learning. But uh, sometimes uh, the lenders themselves don't even know that uh, how how the what the process what, what the machine was doing, and so it could be somewhere because they actually entered, I would say, ten ten thousand variables in there or even more, right? And uh, so a lot of these variables uh, may be related to risk, may be related to uh, you know, whatever. The, a lot of variables that are not, banks are not allowed to use 
in their credit decision may be included in that and the bank, the lenders themselves may not even know. And in addition, a lot of these lenders also use vendors or black box, uh, just subscribe, uh, you know, use third party vendors. And so they pay for the vendors for this process. They input the data in there, but they, they may not understand it. And for us to actually review how they comply with regulations, if they don't know what they have, how they made decisions, we can also, we can tell them whether they did it right or wrong. So uh, that is a concern about this black box, a concern about consumer protection, whether consumers actually know what information was in that pool of data and whether it's accurate and if it's not, how how do we go about correcting? Uh, like we can, sometimes we find out that our credit score is wrong. We didn't, we didn't default on a loan, but somehow there was a false record. So we, there's a process for us to go around to correct that information. It's harder with this aggregate data, alternative data. And so, and also for us as supervisor, we, uh, there is a trade-off that we, well, we try to regulate how financial firms use this data. We also would, it would be ideal for us to also try to encourage them to come up with this innovation, new ways of doing things, because that's important that could uh, make life easier for consumers overall. And also it could expand credit to people who don't have credit record. You know, if you just graduate, and uh, don't have a job, but just grab, had a good, good degree, you want to apply for the first credit card, this alternative information could help you get that credit. Or a small business who uh, don't even, don't have very thin credit file, a lady who wants to start a salon business, for example. How do they get that loan? Square, for example. Does that right? So because they have information about your cash flow in, for your business, uh, or have information about how you make payment, uh, PayPal and Square now actually make loans to small businesses because they have additional information about these consumers that banks don't have and Equifax or uh, TransUnion don't have. Now. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> So this is uh, a, an example of type of type of information that data aggregators have access to. Uh, this is not revealed which aggregator this is, but this is just example, a subset of their members, right? So you can see that they have access to uh, all the credit report, TransUnion, all the Equifax TransUnion. TransUnion experience, they have that. They have bank data, CT, uh, TD, uh, you know, TIAA, and also they have your uh, Facebook, you have, uh, have Walmart, Target. So they can see your shopping habit, they can see uh, your, if what you, basically, they can see that you get up in the morning, you bought a train ticket, you actually go uh, take the train and you pay, pay for Uber and you pay for lunch and you uh, go shopping, these are the sites that you go to and what kind of, uh, what type of Wi-Fi or uh, router you use, uh, are you, do you access it through telephone, uh, iPhone or, or main computer and your quality of your computer, how complex, how sophisticated you are is revealed in all this information, right? And they have access to this. So no wonder it takes only seconds for them to tell whether it, it's your credit worthiness, whether you are worth giving credit to. Uh, and there are, even now, if you better markets, for example, I, I, I've seen that demonstration. They, uh, while you look at a home, enter information in your iPhone, and they actually have shrunk this weeks of uh, correspondence, uh, mortgage application, uh, back and forth, faxing things, actually all collapse into five minutes. So while looking at the home, you can now, with the ML and AI, you can get loan approval in five minutes while looking at the home. <coughs> so that's why this now, uh, our financial landscapes have changed so much. Here are a lot of different startups on FinTech, right? 
So uh, I my my study that's uh, the one I'm going to talk about today uses Lending Club data, which is the largest consumer lending platform. As I mentioned earlier, it uh, was founded in 2006. Now uh, we can see that as of 2010, Lending Club actually started making loans on the mainly West Coast and East Coast. But as of 2016, we can see that it has basically uh, able to develop, obtain this national footprint, and it made, as I said, $28 billion of consumer loans uh, so far over the 10 years period. A lot of it was between 2014 and 16. And uh, a lot of these uh, loans that Lending Club made actually when you go online, you have to go. You have to uh, uh, identify the purpose of the loan that you're gonna, what you're gonna use it for. And you, as you can see, that from 2013 to 15 uh, origination year, most of the loans, up to um, uh, almost 90 percent of these loans, are used to pay off credit card or uh, for debt consolidation. So. Uh, one thing is that if you can make, if you can get a loan from Lending Club at 12% or 15% interest rate, that's much less than paying 28 or 30% on your credit card balance. And that's what a lot of people have been doing. These loans are installment loans, so they are either three years or five year maturity. And you, it's not revolving like credit card. So uh, the reason I'm showing this is because also I use the Lending Club data to compare with our supervisory confidential data that we use for CCAR and credit card account data. And so we wanted to make sure that we are able to compare credit card account data with Lending Club uh, platform. Uh, so we are basically we are comparing credit card purpose with the credit card data that we collect from the bank. And so in terms of credit uh, access, where they make these loans, we uh, use data from summary of deposits, where the, all the deposit activities, branching activities uh, in by, uh, five digit zip. And so that is the landscape uh, of five digit zip markets in terms of mar market concentration, H uh, hoping down index. The larger the F hoping down, uh, uh, more concentration it is, less number of banks for uh, per capita, basically. Uh, and so we can see that about 50% of lending club loans are made in the highly concentrated banking market. So sounds good, right? That uh, it uh, potentially may be filling the credit gap in the areas that have uh, less competition in the banking market. Uh, in terms of uh, branch per capita, we also see that a lot of lending club loans are made in the areas that are blue and blue and red, where uh, there are less number of bank branches per capita. So uh, that also supports kind of uh, consistent with an argument, which is not approved, but consistent with an argument that uh, it may be more need for credit in this area than Lending Club actually is filling the gap. So in terms of who borrows from Lending Club as opposed to uh, sticking with the traditional banks, we compare with uh, Lending Club borrowers with the Equifax Consumer Credit Panel, which includes everyone who has some kind of credit record. And you can see that uh, Lending Club, on average, uh, actually the with Lending Club platform, uh, consumer platform, you have to have at least 650 FICO score. You know what FICO score is. Right? <coughs> so you have to have uh, about 650 FICO score to be able to apply. So the average is a uh, bit higher than 650. And so, it, but it's not too far, not too different from the general consumer credit panel, um, the population. It's that uh, the gap is a little, uh, the, the, the band is a little more narrow because of the restriction. We can see later that a lot of uh, people with 700 FICO scores also borrow from Lending Club. And, uh, it's not surprising that generally people who go from lending club loans uh, for lending club loans are, are not likely to be homeowner. So they don't have the uh, collateral, they can't get home equity, but also tend to be younger and more leveraged. 
Um, now this is the most interesting part that of the, of my study. So we uh, so when lending club when you when you apply for a loan on the lending club platform, they collect information about what you enter, all the decisions that you make. For example, say if uh, your computer IP address is different from the address that you enter in the application, or uh, they can also tell whether you are sitting in the area that is uh, high crime or uh, low income neighborhood, or uh, your decision. Say, for example, if you apply for a loan for 15000 but uh, the application tells you that we can only offer you 8000 and you said, fine, I'll take that. So everything, you know, whatever you de decide to do through the entire process, they collect that information, and throughout the year, they have their own alternative information that they collected. This is proprietary data, and that's used for to assign rating. It's machine learning, right? So they learn from the past and they know these people who behave this way or have done it, all these things actually are more or less likely to default. So in the beginning when I first started in 2007, for loans that, that were originated in 2007, they didn't have this good data set. So they rely a lot on FICO score in assigning the rating grade from A to G. So we see that the correlation between FICO score and alternative uh, and their own rating is very high, about 80% for loans that were originated in 2007. But we can see that correlation declined very quickly to only around 30%, 35% for loans that were originated in 2015. And that's because they are relying a lot more, increasingly more on alternative data in assigning the rating. So, uh, so does it mean that FICO score is less useful now? It's probably because it's very broad, right? And it doesn't have much information, not enough information about each individual person. And so, uh, we can also show that although this rating A to G, which th this rating determines what rate you're going to get the loan for and you to, whether you're going to get the loan and how much you have to pay for it. And that's not correlated with FICO, but we will also show you that following the performance of these loans, actually the ratings are doing very well in predicting default. So we can see, uh, so if we compare FICO score and rating, so we are, as of 2007 on the left panel. Since this is composition of uh, different FICO ranges, FICO segments for different ratings. <coughs> for loans that were originated in 2015 here, we can see that there are a lot of subprime borrowers with FICO less than 680. That lending club actually slot into this A or B rating, which is very good, healthy uh, rating. 8% of A actually uh, are subprime and about 28% of B are subprime. And so we are going to follow <laughs> and, and look at how these, these people perform, right? So uh, here is what we, these are the people who are all, these are all subprime borrowers with FICO less than 680. And lending clubs lock them into different, different ratings from A to G, right? And we can see that the prob probability of default, which is this vertical axis, is actually very consistent with the, with the rating that Lending Club assigned. And that is regardless of their FICO score. You can see that it's, uh, they all have the same FICO score, but their default probability actually varies significantly. And so we expanded the analysis to also look at all the FICO segments, right, in different color. The purple ones are the super prime consumers and the blue ones are subprime, right? And we can see that although they are slotted into many different rating A to G, their default probability is actually more defined by the A to G rating 
than the FICO score rate. Uh, rating. And so this is, uh, we are looking at one year probability of default, but when we look, expand the window to 24 months, because some studies, actually some people claim that Lending Club borrowers tend to, tend to default between 12 and 24 months. So we look at 24 months window as well. And so we can see that default probability goes up because when you look at longer period uh, window, but uh, it's all consistent, the same story. Now that uh, the, the super prime borrowers actually are not, stick, not sticking out too much. So um, again, we uh, compare this uh, the default probability for different risk. Uh, rating grade and um, and FICO segment, and we find that regardless of the FICO segment, so the rating grade basically is the is the one that determines FICO um, uh, default probability. The blue line is the average default for a rated, and the red line is the average default rate for um, B rated. While the the green, the blue, this green bar represents average default rate for the different FICO segments, 680 and higher. Any questions so far? I'm just wondering what the reaction of the traditional rating agencies is to this kind of data. Yeah, uh, so we... They know that, right? First of all, FICO is not updated as frequently as it should be. Second, um, FICO is very broad. So it is well known now within the, uh, in the financial industry that it is a good factor to use as a first cutoff. But it's not it's too broad. It's not defined, refined enough to identify credit risk. Uh, of an individual. Now, also uh, from what we talk about at lunch, that uh, so FICO models may be capturing a lot of different factors, but they are based on reported, officially reported data. And the world has changed now. A lot of data, a lot of information is not officially reported anymore because, let's say, if you turn the load, your income, if your salary is only two-third of your overall income because you have been driving Uber at night, that's not reported. Or uh, if uh, you actually borrow from small platforms, uh, there are tons of small lending platforms now that you can borrow and that they don't report to that Kufax or TransUnion. And so that information is not there. And so if FICO is looking to rate people based on this official data, it's not complete. So that's one reason, and things keep changing, right? Um, so uh, that is well known that it cannot be used, but there are some other rating. I talked to with a uh, vantage score people who now also said that they, their rating now, there are many different versions of rating. Some of them include uh, utility payment, rent payment, and some medical payment after uh, six months it's released. So uh, so they have that information. And when I was sitting in the room with data aggregators, for example, some of them, when we talk about medical information, medical payment, are we covered by HIPAA? Uh, and they said that they can drive a truck through HIPAA. Uh, so, so information is there somehow. And so maybe we have to, uh, <laughs> do something with regulation to, for, to make sure consumers are protected, if that's what we want to do. Also, I wanted to I forgot to mention that when we look at this data, this uh, data aggregator, we can see that they have information about uh, bank information, uh, bank data, they have credit card data. So when we actually go to this doctor's office or the, to a financial investment account or bank account when you open any account, you sign, you acknowledge that 
privacy policy, right? But the policy actually allows them to legally allow them to pass out information without me us knowing about it or being informed. Our information can be passed on to uh, a, an outside vendor that work with the bank or the investment firm or whatever. They can legally do that because if the vendor works for them. So that's how all these data aggregators have access to uh, bank accounts, right? And sometimes you also, when you make, uh, when you apply for a loan, you have to sign to allow them to access your information by giving the social security or uh, your cell phone access. So through that, they can get a ton of information. Um, so it is, it is dangerous, and so once they actually aggregate this information, it's also useful for, for example, for us, there was a load stacking. Because now a lot of consumers, borrowers, try to, uh, try to make sure that they have access to a lot of credit. So, and once you, once you get a loan, your utilization, your uh, credit score would be affected by the amount of loan that you have. So some people actually apply for 10 loans on the same day. It's called loan stacking, right? So, uh, so, that, so all 10 lenders would be using the same information as of today, but in a week you have 10 more loans. So this data aggregator actually can, uh, can help banks identify people who are doing that. So if they apply for 10 loans, some of the more than one application would likely show up in this data aggregate, it's, data, it's a pool of data. So they would be able to tell the lender that, yes, this person actually has a few more applications. Uh, whether they can tell which bank, I'm not sure, but they know that the information is there. So it is useful that way for, could, could be useful for consumers, for within credit file, could be useful for lenders, could be useful for, many, depends on how we use it. It is, that's why consumer, uh, Protection, CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, actually, uh, instead of banning this use of alternative data, they actually issued no action letter because uh, say allowing lenders to use say, your education information or your major or, or, you know, if you just get a degree from Villanova and you don't, you don't have credit record. At least it's useful for you know lenders to know that you just graduated. But so as long as the lenders use it in a responsible way, it's okay as of now. But what is responsible, what's not, it's we, there's more work to be done. Do you see that so lending club has been doing well during an upturn in the economy? Yeah. Do do. You, is it on your, your radar that, you know, when there is a downturn in the economy, that there could be any, like a bigger, this could be like a, a bubble that could burst and there'd be bigger risk at that time? Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, a lot of this platform started after the financial crisis, like in 2008, 9, and 10, but Lending Club actually was established in 2006. So it already has gone through the financial crisis. The growth mostly uh, has been uh, in the last three, four years. But you're right that soon after the financial crisis, it was so much easier for Lending Club to, to follow the initial business model of peer-to-peer -peer lending and marketplace lending, matching borrowers and lenders directly. You know, uh, because interest rate was so low and people who, don't, who want to earn 7% or 10% interest, they can't get it easily elsewhere. So this is a good way to invest, right? And so defaults are actually quite low, right? Now that, that well, as interest rate has gone up recently, it has become harder for lending club to uh, match the demand and supply for the loans. So they started doing their own securitization. So uh, they have gone through two security. Basically, they have to carry some on their book. So this is, you may not have heard this. So let me talk actually, how do they originate the loan? These platforms, to be able to make loans, they are supposed to actually have license in each state, right? 
to avoid having 50 license, what do they do? They actually partner with the web bank. If you, if you actually Google with web bank, you'll find it's in Utah. And this is a small bank that basically lending club platform makes match borrowers and lenders know that which loan to make, but send this to web bank. Web bank originate the loan. So it is a web bank from Utah that originate the loans, and so Lending Club doesn't need 50 license. It's, it is the bank that originated. Keep it for two days, and then send it back to Lending Club. So that avoids its regulations, right? Um, so they don't need the license, and also they're not subject to um, usury law, which is the interest rate ceiling that each state imposes on the loan. So they can pass this loan, sell the loan to anyone, any investors in any state in the country. And uh, whatever the rate that the, the web bank originated, that's fine regardless of where the investors are. So that's how, uh, that's how it works, that's their business model. So, uh, so, and then once they return to the uh, to lending club, lending club actually then could pass it on to. There are consortiums of uh, small community banks that actually is a main pipeline of lending club loans because this allows them to actually make a lot of loans throughout geographic area. They don't. Usually community banks would make loans in the local community because that's all they know, right? They don't have access to na nation foot the national footprint. Through Lending Club, they can actually get more diversified portfolio because, uh, you know, Lending Club makes loans to all this, if you saw their footprint. So it helps the bank diversify. It makes it easier. They can make many, many, many small loans uh, at low cost. So 200 banks in the, this cons form together as a consortium and they partner with Lending Club. And the loan Lending Club make could also be funded by these small banks. So initially it was easy because interest rate was very low. In the last year or two, uh, they had to uh, basically fund the loan initially and securitize it. So, uh, so but with the law, Lord Frank skin in the game. So every time that a financial institution has securitized uh, their loans, they have to keep 5% on their books. So now also they have to start uh, funding it somehow. And we have time for probably one more question. I have a question about the data aggregation that's done uh, and, and how they, they allocate um, loaners or uh, people who want a loan into the different categories, A to G. So have you done any analysis of, you know, you know, what those different categories entail and what kind of data is being used to, to do that analysis? Yeah, I did talk to Lenny Club to understand what information they use, and we can see that they use more and more of their own information because it has less and less correlation with FICO, right? Right. But, uh, so their information, as I said, based on they said they're not using social media data. <laughs> Nobody knows, right? Uh, um, I also know that some data aggregator, actually, not Lenin Club, collects 400 different variables each time each of us log into Facebook account. So, uh, so they don't only know your social network, they don't know how many exclamation marks you use, they know how many pictures of food you post, but also the uh, quality of your, how you access, how long you're there, what time you are logged in, and uh, the quality of your router, everything. It just, they have a, a good picture of who you are by just, you know, from these 400 variables that, uh, that they collect. So for, uh, for Lending Club, they collect information through the application process. That's what they say. So they look at your computer, there are four computer, there are four IP addresses from what I'm doing. I'm not a Comsci person, right? The uh, IP based on your computer and your router, or like sometimes you can actually even VPN in and pretend to be 
that you are in New York, but actually you can be in Russia, right? So that this four IP have to match. And so if they don't match, or if they match, but they don't match with your address that you enter in the application, so all kinds of things they're looking at. So they record everything. They collect hundreds of variables through the application process. And then they know from that information, big data, uh, what happened to you over the next year. They actually report that information actually is on the website. Millions of uh, loans are on their website with the uh, characteristics of the borrowers and performance monthly. So you can see each person may default or, or default, may be delinquent late for six months and then come back again or default forever. You, you can see everything. You can even see the loans that were rejected also on their website. This is incredible. A lot of data. It's very interesting. And how do they, again, get access? Just through their partners and... Um, access to what? To the data. About but their own data, right? Although they, this, is, this is not Learning Club. Learning Club, actually, this is a data aggregator separately that receives data from... You know, have you heard... That one, actually... I took a picture of it when I was talking to them, so I'm not, I took out the, their name because I'm not supposed to even have this, right? But I want to make it, uh, to make, this is an interesting page to see how, you know, what kind of information they have. But this is just one of them. So there are many, and some of them also, uh, because these are with startups, right? These are small, small platforms, and a lot of large financial institutions actually invest in these platforms or, or their members. So they have access. So if they are a member, they have access to the service. Learning Club is not this. This is that they collect their own data. That's what they say. Yeah, but I, I guess I'm curious how they get that data. Oh, because because the banks use them. So if, uh, say, if you are a client of Bank of America, I mean, I'm just making up name, right? Mm -hmm. And the so Bank of America uses a uh, Quovo to do the service. It's a vendor that they use. Quovo will have your bank account information. And Quovo also works for Fidelity, uh, also works for uh, eBay and uh, Walmart. And so there are like 400 different uh, members, more than that. Right, so I have all the information from different entities. And so they provide a service. And so they actually can merge all this data. It is a hard job to merge because data, even the same variables are not defined in the same way, collected by different entities, different firms. And uh, they're collected for different purposes. So, uh, so that is requires a lot of work to merge them all together. But, but once they have it, it's very useful. And there are still questions about who owns it and who regulates the use of this data. Thank you, Jilapa.